I am so delighted to be with you guys. Uh, and I gotta, I gotta tell you why. Let's see if I've got the microphone on. I do. First of all, you all, I think, were the very first to really understand what it meant to be patient-centric. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I've been in this bit business for 22 years and translating from aviation to uh, healthcare, what we've done over there and done in several other industries. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. But first, I've got to get a couple of things out of the way. Sam is from Texas, and I'm from Texas. I've been living in the Pacific Northwest, up there around Seattle, for almost 41 years. But as many of you know, uh, there is no such thing as an expatriate Texan. So I, uh, matter of fact, I used to describe myself as a Texan from Tacoma, which is oxymoronic. It's like being a Houstonian from Kenny Bunkport. <laughs> Something that just doesn't make sense. Or a president from Arkansas, you know. It, Come on now, we've got to pick on Bill. You know how he starts his, uh, his uh, speeches these days, don't you? I'm certainly glad to be with you. Hi, baby. Glad to be with you here today. <laughs> I tell you, this political season, I'm very glad it's over. But uh, one thing I, I do have to say after this, which is uh, basically the way we Texans think, is I appreciate the comic relief since we didn't have Ross Perot to kick around. I, I appreciate Bill's giving us some things to, uh, to laugh about. <laughs> now, I should run through my emergency checklist. I guess I was going to be true to aviation, but uh, that's flight attendant stuff. But, you know, the exits are right here and here and here. And if oxygen masks drop from the ceiling, we're in deep trouble, actually. The uh, the election is over. We're going to keep the Affordable Care Act. The game is on. We are now going to see the changes that you know have been in the progress for a long time. And, and I really do want to talk to you all about being leaders of this, because you understand so much more. You are at the bedside. You are with the patient. You understand patient education. You understand what it takes to get people to, to engage on their own and not end up back in the emergency room. You understand a lot of these things. Respiratory therapists are so far more engaged than so many others are in these changes. And of course, you're, you're also very dependent on how these changes go. It gets to the heart of what we're going to do with things like HCAPs. And HCAPs, as you know, have, uh, have mesmerized to a certain extent many of the hospital leaderships around the country. Many C-suites, many boards are running around hiring hotel companies, basically, to come tell them how to get the curtains to look nicer and make a four-star restaurant out of, the, uh, out of the meals. But they're missing the point. The point is that what we have to do is not just improve the patient experience on a, a, a kind of a, a esoteric basis. We've got to improve the outcomes. You remember the old moniker, no margin, no mission? It's gone. It's gone. The death penalty has been issued to fee for service, and what it's going to be now is no margin, no mission. And uh, that's what I want to talk about. Excuse me, not margin, no, no outcome, no income is what I'm trying to say. No outcome, no income. And an outcome is the most important element that we've got to deal with. Nationwide, we're facing very serious problems. As you know, we're killing between 22 and 30 people an hour on average still between nosocomial infections and medical mistake in the United States. We're up to 18.2% of our gross national product. We're headed to 20.5% in about five years. If we don't do something, we're going to bankrupt the country if we don't get this under control. So it's no longer a matter of waiting for the Supremes or waiting for the election. We now have a lot of work to do, and you guys are right in the forefront of it, even though you don't feel like you're in control, I know. And sometimes, and I understand this very much so, I've been in these positions many times before, too, where you kind of feel like your patron saint is Rodney Dangerfield, right? I don't get no respect. Now, well, believe me, you've got not only mine, I think you've got the abiding respect of every single patient that you've helped, and that is a long, long list, and it's going to get even longer. Uh, by the way, there is a powerful kinship between you guys and pilots before we start talking about aviation. I mean, for one thing, in aviation, we not only teach, but we understand that if you don't keep the airplane under control, nothing else matters. It's all a moot point. As a matter of fact, we used to train this in terms of saying maintain airspeed, maintain aircraft control, fly the jet first. And the same thing with you guys. If you don't maintain the airway, if we don't maintain oxygenation, everything else is a moot point. And we even share the term airway for that matter, which I always thought was fun. It turns out that everything that we talk about in patient safety really comes down to something that we had to learn the hard way in aviation. 
We learned it by things like killing 583 people in the collision of two major jets, two 747s, in the island of Tenerife on March 27th of 1977. We learned it by understanding, finally, that Captain Kirk, in Star Trek terms, I know some of you probably don't like Star Trek, but I'm going to refer to it anyway. Captain Kirk was in our left seat of every airliner. Matter of fact, if any of you ever flew with us before 1977, you flew with a solo pilot. And I know you're going to think about that for a second and say, wait a minute, I didn't. I looked when I walked aboard and there were at least two, maybe three pilots up there. Yes, but only one of them was allowed to use his or her brain. Everybody else was along for the ride. It was the old form of teamwork. I tell you to jump, you ask me how high on the way up. We now know how wrong that is. And we now know that the essence of safety in a major human system, no matter what that system is, is really the human element. In other words, us. We've got to understand how we fail, how we make mistakes, because without that, we're never going to get to where we need to go. Now, the problem is that we don't believe, quite frankly, we don't believe that we fail as much as we do as human beings. We think we are more adept at being perfect. And in fact, every one of you in this room, me included, no matter what pathway got you to the point of respiratory therapy, you all are trained the same way as I am. We're all trained to be Captain Kirk. We're supposed to be omnipotent, infallible. We're not supposed to make mistakes. We're supposed to get it right the first time. But that, you see, is a fraud that we've been perpetrating on ourselves for at least the last 150 years of the Industrial Revolution because human beings cannot be perfect. We can be very good. We can be very good all our careers, but the problem is you can't look each other in the eye and say, I could never make a major mistake. I am so good. And so therefore, we have to lean on some other methodologies. When we finally learned this in nuclear power generation, in industry, in many different places, and certainly in aviation, we began to reduce our accidents to zero. And this is another major point. It's believing in zero. Most of you have confronted this question of, could I ever get to the point of making no mistakes? And if you're really honest with yourself, you know that the answer has been no. I could make a mistake. I'm going to try hard not to. I've got a wonderful track record, but I could make a mistake. I, I could send a patient off after a transfer with an empty oxygen bottle. I could, I could fail to see something that needed to be seen before we released them from the ICU. I could make a mistake. But the fact is that there is a prophylaxis for this, for our own human errors, and that really is ganging us together in teams, what I call collegial interactive teams. Now, the problem is, as I say, that we really don't believe that we're as bad as we are at communication, at transferring uh, ideas between each other. And uh, this is why I put Homer up on the screen, because if you all were wired up, any of us wired up to a really good polygraph and ask if we had most everything under control, we would answer yes. When we talk about keeping things safe in a human system, we have to talk about the realities. And what it takes is teamwork and a collegial interactive teamwork situation. Collegial means that everybody on that team has respect for every individual member, even if that per new person just came in the door after a, a, a two-year education. Wide-eyed, scared to death, that person still may know the key that's going to save your patient, that's going to save a major mistake. And when we can get that communication level in a team, to absolute transparency. And yes, I'm also talking about the team that you find yourself on sometimes when it doesn't look like that you've got any standing at all. If you're in an OR, for instance, and uh, you're in the middle of a procedure and you've got some highfalutin cardiologist over there who doesn't want to talk to anybody, and the nurses may be not paying attention to you, this is where the essence of the professionalism and the patient-centric knowledge that each and every one of you have and have displayed for so long is so very important because you become the guardian of the patient. You really do. And the getting that teamwork to translate to full communication sometimes means some pretty dangerous things. Dangerous in terms of you have to speak up and not stop and not make the assumption that I couldn't be right and he be wrong. You look at how much experience this individual has, this lady, this gentleman. You, you, you've really got to understand what we're trying to teach docs and trying to teach nurses now is the same thing, that unless you are all hanging together, as Thomas Paine once said, you're going to hang individually. In other words, we've got to understand how important it is to transfer information in a completely transparent way. And that, and that is quite a challenge. Now, there are other things that we use too. Checklist. You've been introduced to this over a long period of time. Many of you have been using forms of checklists, your own or others, for a long time. This is a new push in respiratory therapy, and it is so incredibly important. Why? It's not an insult 
to your professionalism. It's not an insult to you. It's basically saying the same thing that I say to myself after so many years in aviation. I was an airline captain for Alaska Airlines before that for Braniff International. Some of you remember Braniff, don't you? Hard to see you out here with the lights. How many of you remember poor old Braniff? Thank you. We failed on May 12th of 1982 at about 4.34 in the afternoon. Not that I remember it well. We failed because we couldn't communicate with each other. Long story, I wrote a book about it. We'll keep that for another day. But the basic idea was with all that background in aviation, uh, one of the things that we had learned only belatedly to do was communicate, but we did understand checklists. And all my career in the Air Force and the airlines, it's been checklist and checklist. And I could have been insulted by that at a certain point. And many of our people were early on. How dare you put this piece of paper in my face? Do you think I don't know how to fly? You don't think I know how to practice medicine? You don't think you'll fill in the blank? The fact is that we as human beings cannot, absolutely cannot be perfect in terms of our memory. And consequently, we need a little aid every now and then. And that's what a checklist is. Every item on a really well done checklist that you use in respiratory therapy has been written in blood. Somebody died to get that there, just like we have in aviation. I, privileged to live on a runway. My house is on a little island uh, called San Juan Island, north of Seattle, and I'm able to taxi out of my own driveway, in essence, and go down to the end of the runway with my little single-engine airplane. Nobody else around. The FAA isn't looking. But I am no more capable of pushing the power up and getting that airplane off the ground without running that checklist than I would be to levitate the airplane by throwing it in the air. I, I can't bring myself to do it. You know why? Because every single item on that little bitty checklist for that single engine airplane was written because somebody died to figure out that we need to do it that way every single time. And here's the beauty of it. As I sit there on a morning or an afternoon or sometimes a pre-dawn takeoff, flying down to Seattle to get on a jet and come talk to somebody, I know that if I run every one of those items exactly the same way every time, there is no way I could ever make that error that caused that particular line to be there. That's the beauty of a checklist. Matter of fact, I would highly recommend to you a book by uh, Atul Gawande, for those of you who haven't read it, called The Checklist Manifesto. It is really a very, very excellent work, and it'll give you the reasons why checklists are so important and also tell you how not to overuse them or misuse them. And by the way, you can misuse a checklist. 1988, Dallas-Fort Worth Regional Airport, or International Airport, I should say. Delta Airlines taken off going to Salt Lake City. You all know Delta. They, the ones who gave us the phrase, I don't know where I'm going to go when I die, but I do know I'll change in Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> they bought Northwest. I'm sure they'll buy the U.S. Air Force any day now. Three qualified pilots crash on takeoff because they forgot to put the flaps down. And yet on the voice tape as they taxied out, they're running the checklist, and when it got to flaps, every one of them said exactly what needed to be said. 1515 green, that means that the outboards and the inboards and the front flaps were all set to the right place, except that they were zero, zero, and there was no green light. This type of thing is what we do as human beings. This type of assumption is based on the idea that we're always going to get it right and you can overdo a checklist. In that case, the ca captain had wanted to change things and have everybody responded. He had taken a checklist and made a mantra out of it. This is a big important thing for you guys as you work into the use of checklists over time and there will be more of them. Don't ever memorize it and don't ever let it become a mantra. Each and every item you need to focus on and make sure it's done that way every single time. That's very, very important. That's one of the mainstays of aviation safety. And one of the other things is standardization. Minimizing variables, best practices, if you will. That's essentially what happened here. You all remember this, don't you? This is uh, the inauguration of uh, new service between LaGuardia and the Hudson by US Airways a few years ago. Didn't turn out terribly well. And I'm not sure you know it, though, but this is what really happened. First class got the rafts. And coach got the wings. You might want to keep that in mind next time you <laughs> book U.S. Airways. Uh, let me just take you through that accident a minute because there's really an important point I want to make. They took off to the north, and they've got these two huge Cuisinarts under the wing. They ate up a bunch of geese who were flying on their own northbound as well. They didn't see the airplane coming. Geese will dive out of, their, out of your way if they see you coming. And, and it, it was enough in each engine that it stopped the engines. Uh, Jeff Skiles in the right seat, the co-pilot immediately tried to restart the engines. Sully Sullenberger in the left seat uh, was watching him. They immediately determined they weren't going to get them restarted. They went through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of denial in about 4.2 seconds, I think. 
turned the airplane toward the Hudson, began to glide, and they had about 15 seconds, that's it, 15 seconds to make the most important decision of their professional and probably personal lives. Now, in that period of time, had we not, not because we're smarter in aviation, but just because we killed enough of us, we had to learn these things, if we had not learned to infuse standard procedures, best practices, minimized variables, they would not have had a procedure for landing this airplane in the water. Or for that matter, to do what they really wanted to do, which was glide to that airport across the Hudson called Teterboro. They thought they had enough energy to do it, enough altitude, enough airspeed. They, they didn't know. But for 15 seconds, this decision was hanging, literally hanging. Matter of fact, let me play you this particular snippet. There we go. Oop, nope, sorry. Let me get it back. Yeah, it's 15.49. Runway 4 is available if you want to make left track to runway 4. It is. Okay, I'm sure we any runway. Uh, what's over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, okay, LaGuardia Departure Guy, Emergency Inbound. Cat is 1529 over the George Washington Bridge, wants to go to the airport right now. Yeah, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway 1? Runway 1, that's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280, you can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. We're going to be in the Hudson, and that's exactly what they end, where they ended up. But in that 15 seconds, you see there was a procedure for putting it in the water, there was a procedure for gliding if they wanted to, but if there hadn't been, what we would have heard on that voice tape was a variation of this. Jeff, what do you think? Is, is the best glide speed 235, 230, 210, 220? And what do we do if we put it in the water? Is it gear up, gear down, flaps at 1, 2, 5, 10, 15 degrees? And what speed do we use? Is it minus 5, minus 10, marker minus 20? There go your 15 seconds right there. And these guys, because I've talked to both of them, they're going to look over there and they're going to see themselves sinking in relation to where they really want to go, to this airport with a hard runway, and they're going to make an emotional decision and they're going to die, all of them because they're going to hit a bunch of brick houses a mile short of the runway because they couldn't make it to the runway at about 150 miles an hour in what is essentially a metallic eggshell. The only reason we got them back is because we had given them best practices, standard procedures. There was no reason to reinvent the wheel. It was not only checklist, you see, but it was also standard methodologies of doing things. This is something that's hard to learn in medicine, but over time we're going to have to in every aspect of it. This is Sully Sullenberger, of course, and I've gotten to know Sully, a wonderful guy, really a captain's captain. Uh, however, you know what we do as Americans, we put somebody up on a pedestal. Thank you. I will relay that to him. He'll appreciate it. And he's fellow former Air Force, too, but I was <laughs> not going to pander in that. But, uh, you know, what we do as Americans, we put somebody up on a pedestal, and immediately, what do we do? We throw mud balls at them. I started getting this in my uh, mailbox literally within three weeks. You know, checklist utilization, minimization of variables, standards, best practices also come up against a real wall. Two of them, in fact. You know what the dangerous, most dangerous phrase is in respiratory therapy? Now, check me if you think I'm wrong. Quote, this is the way we've always done it, end quote. Everybody agree? I guess for equal time, I have to tell you the most dangerous phrase in aviation is, quote, watch this, end quote. <laughs> Here, Fred, hold my coffee, watch this. You really don't want to hear that out of your pilot trying to get any of us to go in a different direction, because we're in the middle of a cultural change, a massive cultural change, and, and you have in the past been kind of relegated to them being a member of the team, but maybe kind of a siloed member of the team. The fact is we've got to make the teams much more finite, and we've got to get rid of the silos. But the problem is to get people to do this is a cultural imperative. Culture is like asking a fish to describe water. It's all around us all the time, but it's very difficult to describe, and yet it affects everything. Culture change also takes a long time. I have to tell boards of directors and watch their faces drop that it may be 20 to 25 years before a culture change is complete. But the beauty of it is that you can get things done immediately. You just have to maintain the pressure. You have to keep talking about it. You have to keep informing and motivating everybody on why these changes are necessary. That's what talking to each other is about. That's what building a collegial interactive team is about. But unfortunately, this epithet that we throw at doctors about you know, trying to get them to go in the same direction is really applicable to everybody in medicine. We know this is high risk. 
And when it's high risk and you know that the way you've been doing it seems to work, you're really very reluctant to change. But change is exactly what we've got to do. But herding cats isn't, I mean, we throw that around. But, but that's what it feels like at times, to get everybody together. This is why you're in such a position of leadership and it doesn't feel like that at times, but you really are. You're the ones with the expertise in keeping that airway open. You're the ones with the expertise of keeping those particular machines going, of briefing the patient, of doing all the things that you do to maintain life. Sometimes it really does depend on you more than anybody else on the team. But, but speaking up at the right moment, knowing when to say the things that are necessary and never backing off when a patient depends on it is such an important such an important responsibility. I want to talk about, but you go, yes, please, not just to clap for what I said, but clap for you guys. Thank you. Now, I really, as a true Texan, should say y'all instead of you guys, but it just, I've been hanging around the East Coast too much. Let's talk about how we fail as humans. This is important because we really don't look at it this way. If I can't get you to do anything else but think of things in a slightly different angle than you did when you walked in this morning, then I will have succeeded because I want to take you about 13 to 14 degrees off what you're used to and show you the way we fail in ways that maybe you haven't thought about. And these are not pejoratives. These are not saying we're terrible creatures because we can't get it right 100% of the time. It's part of being human and understanding this is important. Perception. We get things wrong. That's the essence of that accident in Dallas I was talking about. Three qualified people look forward and see something that is not there. And you all have your own examples. There's no one in this room who hasn't misread something. There's no doctor, there's no anesthesiologist, no nurse, no pilot who hasn't made a mistake. Most of the time, we're so good, we manage to pull it back from the brink. Or somebody tells us about it, which is the essence of teamwork. But we don't perceive everything correctly. The second one is assumption. We make assumptions all the time. You couldn't get through the day without assumptions. But let me, let me give you a little quick takeaway. If any assumption that you're about to make in dealing with a patient or patient care in any way, if wrong, could hurt somebody, you have the right to make that assumption versus checking it out? Because I would argue that you don't. And we can revolutionize an awful lot of the things that have been going wrong in patient safety. We can just do that if we can just get that one right. And this is the big one, communication. How many of you in here have heard the phrase, I know you think you understood what you thought I said? Huh? But I don't think you realize that what you heard was not what I meant. Anybody in here who's married understands this, right? <laughs> or in a relationship, right? I mean, don't we go through, we lose marriages every day for this. You said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. And in fact, there was no communication. It wasn't a matter of garbled, it just never occurred. We do this because we are terrible at communication. I've got friends who say there's one other dance that you need to put in there and that's forgetfulness, but I don't think that's one of the big three. And yet this is a great example of it. I was foolish enough to show this at the Kennedy Space Center about three years ago. We had a bunch of hospital CEOs we were taking around and, uh, and they were very gracious to show them how NASA did safety after losing two shuttles. And, and I was really worried about this. I had two astronauts in the room and a whole bunch of launch crew, but they fell on the floor laughing. So that apparently is NASA approved. Now, having said that, one of the astronauts comes up. This is a guy with three missions afterwards. He said, that was the Buzz Aldrin situation. And I said, I, I don't understand. He said, well, you remember Apollo 11, Mike Collins there in the middle uh, had to stay in orbit while the other two guys went to the moon. Neil Armstrong, we just lost about a month ago. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Buzz Aldrin on the right. Neil's already out on the moon. He said that breathless phrase that every one of us remembers so well. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. And now, 30 minutes later, he's got the camera trained on the limb, the lunar excursion module. His partner is coming down the steps. He knows he's excited. And on the way to the moon, Neil also knows that NASA Mission Control in Houston had called and said, guys, even though there are nine interlocks necessary to lock the door of the limb, we forgot to put a handle on the outside. So don't close it when you get out on the moon. Now he sees his partner climbing down, all excited. He's looking at that blue marble we all live on, knowing about 50% of the humans on there are listening to him because his mic is hot. And he sees Buzz's gloved hand come up as if he's going to grab the door and close it. And he wants to, in the worst way, say, Buzz, don't close the door. But if he had, that is what we would remember. 
Neil Armstrong died the day, the first man on the moon, and the guy who issued those wonderful, breathless words, Buzz, please don't close the door. That's, that's, that's the way. I did not know that story until then. Uh, when we look at our communications levels, there is a very true figure that actually is a little low, 12.5%. It's actually about 13.8% of the time. People who have the same linguistics, the same regionalisms in their voice, the same level of education, do not understand what they are saying to each other, and we just don't believe it. That's back to the Homer thing. If you wired us up and said, do you believe that? You, you might say yes, but it would blow the machine up because we don't in our heart of hearts. We think we're better than that, but we're really not. Here's another good illustration. Hello. Hi. Hi. Let's play the stranger. Okay. When someone gets home tonight, someone should be wearing a naughty French maid's outfit, a blonde wig, and holding a six-pack of Bud Light. Me like you, the stranger. Oh, you mean... For the great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down. Wow. Oh, whoa, stranger. Make it a Bud Light. It's so another, another old Super Bowl commercial. Now, you've got to get past a willing suspension of disbelief that the poor doofus couldn't figure that out, right? But once you do, this is what we do to each other all the time. When you diagram that sentence, when someone gets home tonight, somebody should be wearing. That can go in either direction. And then what do we do? We get upset, or somebody gets upset with us because we ask for a clarification. It's like the doctor I was in an emergency room in New York a number of years back, taking notes all night in the ED, and uh, one, the, the, the chief resident had had a tough night. He's going out for a Coke, and he's giving three really important medication orders as he goes out of the door. The only problem is there are no nurses at the nurse station. When he comes back 10 minutes later, I tell him and he can't get his arms around this. He said, well, that's impossible. Somebody should have heard me. And I said, no, doc, there were no nurses at the nurse's station. He said, well, somebody must have heard me. What is that? If a doctor gives an order in the forest and nobody hears him, <laughs> was it really an order? Uh, and you know, the fact was it wasn't arrogance and it wasn't hubris. He was so, like all of us, so prone to speak and expect that everything he said was going to be understood that, that he could not get his arms around the idea that that might not happen. We are like this, unfortunately, and we are heir to that. As a matter of fact, we also do something called talking past each other, which is very detrimental. I got a good example that a couple of doctors sent me from England, and I was rather surprised. We can all go on this site and make our own cartoons, and I figured this is going to be nothing. But when I watched it and picked myself up off the floor and stopped laughing, I realized I've had that conversation. Now, two things. The guy on the left is an orthopedic surgeon. The one on the right is an anesthesiologist, supposedly. He's trying to book a case, and there's a word that I think is asystole, uh, which is complete cessation of heart activity. In England, they call it asystole. So just watch and tell me if you haven't had this very conversation. Hi. Hi. Are you the registrar of anesthesia? Yes. I need to book a case. Who are you? I'm the registrar of orthopedia. Sure. What's the story? There is a fracture. I need to fix it. Okay. Tell me more. There is a fracture. I need to fix it. <laughs> there is a fracture. I need to fix it. Can you tell me more? The fracture is very displaced. I need to fix it. Okay. Let's start from the basics. Where is the fracture? The fracture is in the emergency department. I need to fix it. That's not what I meant. Who does the fracture belong to? The fracture belongs to a bone. The bone is a femur. And who does the femur belong to? Ah, uh, the femur belongs to a 97-year-old lady from a nursing home. Okay. Anything else you can tell me? She is fasted. That is good. Any comorbidities? She is otherwise well. Except for... Except for what? She has a condition I have not seen before. Which condition is that? A systole. A systole. A systole. Right. And you want me to anesthetize her? There is a fracture. I need to fix it. Why didn't you tell me about it from the start? I did. There is a fracture. <laughs> I need to fix it. No, no, a systole. Because then you might refuse to anesthetize her. Don't you think I'd have noticed a systole when the patient arrived in the anesthetic bay? It will not take me long to fix the fracture. I'm very skilled with hammers and power drills. She is not fit enough for a haircut, let alone an operation. There will be minimal blood loss. 
I think she has other management priorities at the moment. Like the fracture. Like CPR. Ah, they have finished doing that. Oh. They have stopped doing CPR on someone in a systole. Yes. That means she is dead. There will be minimal blood loss. You know what? You're right. There is not much blood loss when there's no friggin' cardiac output. <laughs> I need to fix the fracture. Please go away. You are being obstructive by refusing to do my case. And you are making my head hurt. There is a fracture. I need to fix it. I need to go and punch a brick wall. If you break your hand, I will fix it for you. Anybody not have that conversation? <laughs> we, <laughs> we garble this up all the time. And you know when we're standing looking at each other nose to nose, 92% of our communication is nonverbal. Uh, I mean, you know, have you ever had that happen? Somebody says, yes. <laughs> we, we really have to get a handle on this. Let me tell you why it's so important. I've asked every audience, and I want to ask you the same thing. Over the last, oh, about 19 months, every medical audience, I've asked the same question. Have any of you ever seen a patient safety disaster or near disaster that did not involve, as a critical component, a failure in communication of some sort? Anybody? Did I see one hand? I saw one about three months ago, and it turned out she didn't understand the question, but you all are consistent. You know that's about 19,000 people? Maybe wait with you guys, maybe 20, 21,000, but the whole point is this. That means that you can't really have a disaster or near disaster in, in, in terms of patient safety without a communications breakdown. So if we pay attention to the communication, written, verbal, nonverbal, every way, the way we hand off a patient, this is where it gets back to checklist, to get back to doing things in a way that we are absolutely eliminating the possibilities that we use that checklist for, and that we are making sure that we are engaged. And, and I know this is so tough for some of you, many of you guys, it, it's when somebody's putting pressure on you, the moment is putting pressure on you. Maybe a doc is putting pressure on you to go ahead and move and get past, jump past the normal procedures. Don't do it. Don't do it. I tell you, it's, it is so easy to jump one procedure, and here's the point. Somebody's always watching. You know who it is? It's Murphy. Murphy never sleeps. You all know Murphy's Law, right? If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And the prime corollary, and we understand this in aviation, the prime corollary to Murphy's Law is Murphy was an optimist. And <laughs> never give Murphy an opportunity. Uh, in aviation, we changed tremendously. But again, we're not, we're not smarter than medicine. We're not smarter than you guys. We just killed enough people. We had to figure some of this stuff out. We had to figure out how to take human failure, expect it, expect communications failure, and build a team to stop it. And here's why that's so important. I consider there are three tiers to a human safety system. And you're right in the middle of this. Tier one is what we already know how to do, to minimize the opportunity for human error, and system error for that matter. This is why we train. This is why we try to learn from other mistakes, ours and everybody else's. This is why we try to use forcing functions, and we use checklists and all that. But at the end of the day, at the wall of tier one between that and tier two, what I call tier two, we're still going to have things roll across. We're still going to have latent errors in the system. We're going to have individual errors. And if you're sitting there waiting on the basis that the system couldn't produce any errors, then you have absolutely wired failure in. Don Berwick, many of you know Don Berwick, uh, who was heading up CMS, Dr. Don Berwick, good friend of mine. Um, I, th I think that he came up with one of the most eloquent explanations about eight or nine years ago when he said that any human system, if built on the expectation of perpetual human perfection in terms of its performance, it has hardwired failure into its midst. Hardwired. So in other words, if we don't have a tier two, if we just have a tier one and we expect perfection, we are always going to be surprised by the failures and we are always going to hurt people and we are always going to have problems. Tier two is where we have a collegial interactive team and that team is standing there saying almost happily, you know what, we know we're still going to mess up. We're pretty good. But we know we're still going to mess up, and the system is going to mess up, and we are ready for it. One of our elements of pride is that we communicate so well that nothing is going to roll across that line. Well, there is no barrier to our speaking to anybody else on this team, regardless of how long somebody's been on, on the job, regardless of how uncommunicative somebody wants to be.
There's a tier three, by the way, which is when everything else is working well, you've got a t good team and somebody speaks up and says, hey, excuse me, I'm worried about something. And the team turns around and doesn't say, when I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. They turn around and say, hey, we're, we're in good shape. We know what we're doing. And then you've just cut off a 5% worry with a 95%, almost hubris level of assurance. Never, this is a really important point, one I want you to take away. Never invest more than 50% expectation of success of anything you do clinically. Because if you're never over that line, and we had to learn this in aviation and nuclear power too, if you're never over that line, that if anybody voices a concern or even looks concerned, you're all over it. Because you know that the possibility exists that there could still be, despite everything else that's been done well, an error. So somebody speaks up and says, I'm not sure of something. The whole team stops and says, if you're not sure of it, we're not sure of it. What is it that's bothering you? That's very, very important. Um, in the airline business, by the way, what I put up there a minute ago, let me get that slide back up. This is Hong Kong, the old airport. And, and I don't know, any of you ever fly into Kai Tech Airport back in the old days? Got a few hands out there. And you guys know that the approach was basically this. You would aim at the city, you would fly through the lobby of the Intercontinental Hotel, make a right at the elevator stack, pop out the side door, see the checkerboard on the building and make a, a right turn. Th this was very common to be in downtown Hong Kong and see a jet that close or to uh, uh, see it turning like that in downtown. And from the buildings down there, this is the view of the runway that you often got. Today, if that happened, that captain would lose his fourth stripe, probably never to get it back. The first officer would be elevated throughout the whole airline. He would be lauded as having done the right thing. And the whole world has changed for us because we understood that we could not have one carbon-based brain who could be fallible controlling everything. This is why teamwork is so important. And I know that sometimes I'm not just preaching to the choir, but you really dearly want this to happen, but you're being blockaded. But you see that persistent voice of saying, can we talk about what just happened after the fact? And getting together and saying, we need this kind of communication. Doc, wouldn't you want me to know or to tell you, rather, if you were about to do something catastrophic, wouldn't you want me to tell you? And in any venue, whether you're talking therapist to therapist, doctor to therapist, whatever the, the venue, the fact is that that communication from the, lo the loudest voice to the least of the voices is so important, going the opposite direction. Let me give you an example. I flew this particular airplane in the U.S. Air Force for a lot of years. It was a Lockheed C-141. Uh, we don't have them around anymore. They're all being cut up out in the desert. On a day in 1988, by that time I was a lieutenant colonel, I came in to fly a trip. I was a reservist up at McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. We're going to Elmendorf in Anchorage, Alaska. It's a three and a half hour trip. I had been taught originally to be Captain Kirk. Tell everybody who, what, where, when, how, and why. Absolutely omnipotent, infallible, which of course would have been a fraud. And now I've been taught that my most important duty when I walked in to the command post that day, and I had 11 people around the table, and I'm the aircraft commander, is to bind the men to a human team by shaking everybody's hand, looking them in the eye, calling them by first name. And many of you guys in here, I've got a whole bunch of Air Force brethren in the room, and you know the 141, and you know the big crews we used to have. I did that this particular morning, and the third guy I shake hands with is a brand new 18-year-old loadmaster right out of school, eyes as big as fried eggs, a, a flight suit with factory creases and no insignia, and he wants me to look any place else but him. So I know that I'm going to have to pay some attention to him if I'm going to get him to be a part of the team and speak up. I then tell him the who, what, where, when, how, and why. We're going to be flying up there for three and a half hours. We've got 75,000 pounds of gas. We're out on Juliet 8, all this stuff. No cargo, just about 30 passengers, mostly military families. And I then get to the point that was not native to my training, where I'm told to back off and say to everybody, you are my eyes and my ears. You know what? I'm a very good aircraft commander. Reed, I'm a very good respiratory therapist. Reed, I'm a very good anything. But I am a human being, and I cannot look you in the eye and tell you there's no way I could make a major mistake. Therefore, I need all the help I can get, because we've got a lot depending on our doing this right. We're flying over a lot of people, if nothing else. So I've got to go back around this table, look each of you in the eye, and I want a blood oath from you that you would not hesitate for a nanosecond to speak up if you saw, heard, felt, or even intuited that something was wrong. Of course, I get to my new guy, and he's really nodding, thumbs in the air. Get out to the airplane, I say this to him again, put a headset on him, I want him to ride with us up in the cockpit, and I'm still not convinced. And I don't know why I made such a big deal of it this day, but I finally set him down and said, look, I don't know if you can get past this colonel thing. You know, you're an airman basic, I'm a lieutenant colonel. But I need to know, and he interrupts me. He says, sir, I get it. 
It's just like talking to my big brother. If I use a modicum of respect, I can tell him anything I think he needs to know. I thought, God, I couldn't do that at age 18. I'm really impressed. And I said, yeah, that's it, because you see, it's not an invitation. It is not a license to speak up. This is your job. And he says, yes, sir. It's a clear blue sky day. We get ready to go. I don't think much more about this. We're blasting off. Now we're climbing like an intercontinental missile. Uh, we're coming through 14,100 feet. I hear a click on my headset, and this, this timorous little voice that I can still hear in my head says, oh, pilot, loadmaster, 14,200, 14,300. And I'm thinking, hey, he's speaking up. This is good. I don't know what he's going to say, but at least he's speaking up. Yeah, load, go ahead, Mr. Pilot, 14,400. 14,500, uh, sir, 14,600, I'm probably wrong, 14,700, but I could have sworn 14,800, they only cleared us to 15,000 feet. I looked over at my co-pilot, he's on it immediately. Seattle Center, Mac 50235, we're cleared to uh, 17,000, 17,000, roger. 14,900, 14,950, finally the laconic voice of the controller comes back. Negative, Mac, you're cleared to 15. Good Lord, pull the power back, push the airplane over zero G to everybody out in the back. I got 30 floaters back there going, I guess I'm dead. <laughs> I sneak back to the altitude, heartbeats off the chart. I'm trying to, you know how things dilate when you're in an emergency? Time dilates. And I'm trying to think of where I can buy this kid the biggest stake in Anchorage. And no, I'll never tell you what we really bought him, but I'm, I'm looking at my... My co-pilot, I flew through Vietnam with this guy. He's unperturbable. If a wing fell off, he would order coffee on the way down. But he's looking up, and his face is pasty, and I can't figure it out until I follow his gaze. And then it becomes rather apparent, because what he's looking at is the very solid metallic belly of a Boeing 747-200 owned by Northwest Orient coming in from Tokyo, 336 passengers aboard. I called and checked later. He's right over my head at 16,000 feet. We would have climbed right into him. We would have all come apart, rained people in parts. It would have been one of the worst, probably the second worst accident in, in airline history, and I wouldn't be standing here. That's personal. Just an airplane story, right? Anybody in here who doesn't understand what I'm saying? When you invigorate that one voice, whether it's yours or somebody else's, when that voice is not silenced by fear, by concern, by anything else, when that focus on your patient and patient-centric care, which is the patient is the center. In other words, everything is subordinate to the best interest of the patient. When you achieve that, you have not only upheld the highest level of ethics and the highest level of expectation and practice, you're really doing God's work. This is what you would want for your wife, your daughter, your kid, your mother, your father. And if that's what we want for them, that's what we want for all of us. I, uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Thank you so very much. I want to end with one little clip that was not done for health care. It was done in England. And the people who put this together, I think, inadvertently hit us right where we live in medicine. This is what you try to do every single day. And bless you for it. Thank you very much.